Hi, this is Crystal Moore. I hope you're, uh, hope you're there. I know you might have been hearing us talking and wondering why you weren't um, actually hearing us, but just seeing us. So I want to welcome our guest today. Her name is Riley Daltrey, and she is an area vice president for facility solutions at Staples. And we were just chatting about the differences and the generation gap between women uh, leaders today compared to maybe when I was, uh, was a woman in corporate America as a female leader. So why don't you go ahead and give a, a quick introduction, Riley, so the audience can get to know you. Yeah, so I'm, I'm Riley Darty. I've been at Staples for 12 years. Um, I am a co-chair of our Staples Women in Sales Leadership Group that we have. Um, I'm a big promoter of women in leadership as well as being your authentic self. Uh, a couple other groups that I work for outside of Staples um, is I'm on the board of directors for Hygia, which is a part of a nonprofit part of ISSA, which promotes women in the cleaning industry. And then uh, I work with Lazarus House on their board and as a volunteer that promotes um, poverty alleviation through education. And a lot of um, the people they serve there are women as well. Um, I also participate in Factor 8 Girls Club that promotes women um, in professional organizations and their advancement. Yeah, and that's where you and I met, was actually through uh, women sales professionals. I I'm, was following some of the ladies on LinkedIn and I got involved in that hashtag Girls Club. Uh, I remember seeing posts from you that were kind of inspiring. You know, here it was a young female executive who was you know, working for a large corporation, but at the same time, promoting women leaders. And I was impressed by that. And that's why I wanted to have a conversation with you so that we could share with our audience kind of past, present uh, challenges that might be happening in today's world with women and leaders and any advice that we both can <laughs> offer them. Um, I also, I think when you were doing your introduction, I don't think you mentioned that you're a mother of a, of a three and a half year old. Yes, I am a mother of a, a, a vibrant three and a half year old. <laughs> yeah, that's a great age. And I, I mean, obviously, my I'm a grandmother now, right? I have a six month old grandchild. So we we definitely are, are two different generations. I wanted to mention to the uh, to the audience, too. I am sitting at my mom's kitchen table for this show. OK, so it's very cozy here in western Pennsylvania um, and I'm doing the show at the table. So I guess that's just the, um, the the greatness of being flexible. I was I had to travel here, so I'm doing the show, and I the show must go on, right? <laughs> I'd like to like to hear about your leadership journey. So why don't you tell us a little bit about starting out? I think you started out in sales, and then you know kind of grew in that role. But what was it like, and what are some things that you learned along the way in terms of your own journey into um, into leadership? So I started off um, as a sales rep at Staples, um, and I have worked my way up through the company area, sales managers, regional sales directors, um, was part of the creation of a couple different um, divisions that we've had in our sales organization, and now I run our facility solutions team um, for the inside sales uh, division. It has been um, it has been a great journey, and I have learned something um, every step of the way. I think the biggest thing that I've learned from the beginning is you need to take risks and you need to be 100% okay accepting a position that when you look at the job qualifications that you don't qualify for today, but that you know that you can learn and that you can succeed in. So um, that's probably the biggest thing that I've done, especially the job I have today. I remember looking at it saying, "Go!" I remember going home and thinking, oh wow, do I have the skills to do this? And actually one of my mentors, um, her name was Amy Appleyard or is Amy Appleyard, um, and she, provided me with a lot of insights through conversations we've had um, through lunches and just conversations of you can do this, like you've got this. And I think that has been a big pushing point and I, that I reflect back on as I've continued to advance in my career and not even in new responsibilities, but just going through massive organizational changes. Um, having that type of mentorship the past few years of my career has really given me the confidence that I need to feel as if I can execute successfully on these new challenges as they come up. Yeah, I like what you're talking about. And um, I'd like to break that down into maybe two different subjects for a moment that we can all learn from. The first one would be mentorship. And I'd like to talk more about the importance of it, how to find a mentor in your organization. 
Um, but the one thing that I heard from you too was you were a salesperson that grew into a leadership role, but maybe not as confident or certain that, you know, you were, I don't know, the right person for the job, so to speak. But I want to share with you, I had a similar experience. I was a pretty good salesperson that got thrown into management and I never really had uh, a mentor to help me along the way until maybe, you know, 10 years later. So I'm, I think what I did was a lot of self-reflection and uh, I'm going to tell a quick story. I was sent to management school and after an acquisition. So I get acquired, my this small business gets acquired by a large corporation and they send me to management school. And I'm thinking, me, I what do I need to go to management school for? You know, look at the numbers. We're doing great. And I was offended by it. And it was during that time that I started hearing these things like, giving proper feedback or motivating and inspiring others. And this was a language that I never even heard of. I was all about showing the ropes and closing the deals. And um, I started, I put it into practice and it, it, it made a significant difference in the impact on the sales organization because I was changing. I was changing who I was as a leader and seeing the difference it was making in, in the actual business and in people's lives. So I'm wondering if you had like that moment where you made a change or, or you made a shift and that you can remember. I clearly remember it. It was my first year in management. I remember I accepted this role to move to Long Island. And I remember unpacking my bag, showing up at work the first day and saying, oh my gosh, what, what was I thinking? Now what do I do? And I really struggled that first year, not because I didn't have people to go to, but exactly what you said. I, I looked at management as like, my job is to make sure people execute on their numbers. And I, in doing that, forgot what got me into the position to get the leadership role was my personality and my ability to connect with people and my ability to motivate the team that I was on as an individual contributor before. And I think that that's where a lot of managers fail is the first piece is, and especially women is, we're, we, so, we just want to be so successful that we can sometimes forget the, the personal element that goes into leadership. So I, I think the first, it was probably six months into that role in New York where I just was at the point where I was pulling my hair out. What was I doing? This, this isn't for me. I made the biggest mistake. I moved my whole self down here. What am I doing? And the minute I stopped and went back to what made me successful as a leader, it was an individual contributor, but a leader on the sales team I was on back in Boston was my personality. It was when I was my authentic self. I talked to people like I normally would. I led people the way I would want to be lead, uh, led. Um, and that really was a turning point for me. And I actually just got a phone call from somebody. Um, I hadn't talked to them since I was in New York, so at least six, seven years ago. And he called me actually within the past couple months and just said, I want to thank you uh, for everything that you taught me and the excitement that you brought to sales for me. I didn't think I would ever do sales. And I just want to take an opportunity to thank you. And I, and I, that all really came together at that six month mark when I learned if I was my authentic self and motivate, motivated people like I did when I was on um, my team in Boston, I could be successful. Yeah, it's interesting that we're even talking about this exact subject because, okay, so 20 years ago, I felt that I needed to um, act like a man or, you know, in order to be accepted, let's say, you know, I had to, do, I remember uh, we were, the company was bought by Boise Cascade office products at the time. And we said, you bleed green and everybody has to act alike and look alike. And, you know, you dress alike. So I found myself trying to fit in and it was at that point when I decided to take who I truly am authentically and what my skills are and where my strengths are and create a leadership style around me instead of trying to be maybe who I wasn't or trying to be fake, you know, I guess there's no better word for that right now. Um, and there was a little bit of that fake until you make it kind of thing. But it wasn't until I really had the confidence and came into my own that 
I had the biggest impact in terms of, you know, the leadership style on others. Um, hadn't really thought about that. And you talk a lot yeah. about authenticity. I do. And, and I think a lot of it that to be your authentic self is I struggle with the same thing that you're talking about. I, I remember, I, I do believe, and, and I know we've talked about this uh, in the past as well, that I do believe that there's, a, there's an opportunity to meet in the middle on, on some things and we need to be inclusive of, e of each other and it, I should learn things that about other people that they, um, and they should be willing to learn more things about me so that we can collaborate together. But I remember when I was started off in sales and it was the first probably year that I was an individual contributor in the sales position. And it was a team of all men. It was all male leadership. And so I found myself looking up the sports page <laughs> um, yeah. before going into work because that was the only way I could participate in the conversation at the lunch table. And it's not that I don't like sports, played sports my whole life. It's just not something that I would typically read every morning. And I found out I, need to, I needed to know who made the touchdown pass or who had the highest points in, in the basketball game in order to participate in the conversation. Um, and I'm not saying that it was necessarily a wrong thing. It definitely allowed me to find a common ground with them. Um, but you're right. I wasn't bringing my authentic self about things I would have rather talked about, which I did. I have eventually learned that I can integrate those into conversations. Yeah. So that, that um, brings something to mind. And in my day to fit in, <laughs> I, you know, I would smoke cigars and drink drink martinis that I, I like that that's me I mean I grew up above a bar I can smoke cigars and drink martinis with anybody um, <laughs> but I'm wondering if it was if it was because I fit in in that way you know I mean I, I have three brothers and I'm used to hanging with the guys and I'm wondering to other women out there we're talking about almost being able to fit in but not in an unauthentic way is there any thoughts or advice that you might give women in a, in a highly male dominated industry on how to balance that? Yeah, well, it, I think it's everyone's individual responsibility to network. And so how would you network with your customers? It's the same way that you, you're, you're, you're trying to network inside. Everyone is a customer. They're either internal customers at your company or they're external companies, uh, external customers. Uh, I, I don't believe that you should be someone you're not. So mm -hmm. if you're, if everyone's going to the bar and you don't drink, you can still go to the bar and have water, right? And you can find a common ground to talk about. I do feel like I differ with people on, on this. I know some people are like, well, I'm not that way. And I, and I, and I'm not going to go that way. Mm -hmm. um, but I do believe everyone has an individual responsibility to find ways and find common grounds to network. Uh, I never played golf. And then I found out that there was a lot of business men and women that were golfing. Uh, and so I picked up golf and I learned to golf. And actually, I love golf now. <laughs> I'm not that good at it, but I, I do like the conversations yeah. that take place there. So I think that there's always an opportunity for, for both men and women to start to ask questions, uh, inclusive questions that allow us to have open minds and diverse perspectives and, and be willing to try things that maybe you typically wouldn't have naturally. Yeah. What I heard just now is that male and female need to open that up. So, you know, I know you, you play golf, I enjoy golf and it does tend to be more of a man's game and in business, a lot of business is done and, and it's just, it's a lot of fun, but you also, um, mentioned you know reading the sports page and keeping up and, and so you'd be able to be a part of the conversation i'm wondering what men can do to help us uh, feel more inclusive so that they are meeting us halfway have you seen any examples of that well i think not not all women are the same and not all men are the same either mm -hmm. so i think if I, I mean if i were a male leader and what i would instruct my male leaders to do is to sit with their teams and find out where are the points of common interest or or points that people may be curious in learning about each other yeah. that can be topics that can be discussed about um I, I work with a lot of men too that don't read the sports page so uh for them i need to make sure i'm inclusive when i'm speaking with them of the points of interest that that we can find a common ground on um that ultimately can lead to diverse points of thoughts as well yeah that's awesome and and really it's, it's the same way with customers right exactly yeah. it's the exact same thing you would do with customers you're yeah, just doing it internally as well it's about connecting and i think from a, a leadership characteristic or an attribute that is probably 
something that should be at the top of the list. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering about culturally, do you think things have changed for, um, for women in general um, in corporate America? Well, just from the stories that I've heard from others that have been in corporate America for, for much longer years than myself, and <clears throat> I often will speak of Carla Harris. She was an African-American woman on Wall Street back in the 80s, and mm -hmm. she talks about her struggles. Uh, from my perspective and what I've gone through is that there's definitely a, a, a new focus on, on, on women and diversity and, and even more inclusion. And I sometimes think it's un unfortunate that diversity can sometimes have like a negative connotation to people because it feels like it's being maybe shoved. Um, but there's this whole inclusion piece that is now, I feel like, just integrated into corporate America, at least from my experience, and, and companies really doing what they can to find ways to mm -hmm. encourage people to start groups such as women in leadership groups to bring to bring diverse perspectives up through the the, the from individual contributor positions where we may see an equal stat of of men and women all the way up through the executive C suite. Yeah, I think that there is definitely um, an intentional interest in in that or expanding that because they've they've seen it work too. You know, having that um, you know the the different energies and the and, and the different um, diversity at the table and in collaboration and in teams and and working. Um, I'm sorry. You're selling is 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 just so I don't mean to cut you off, but no. I think another piece too we forget we we need to be the face of our customers. So if we're collaborating and we're all the same, even if it's all women that look look and sound and act just like me, we're going to leave out you know 90% of the world where we're trying to collaborate on decisions. Um, that we think our customers want. So I, we can't forget that piece that you, what your team looks like internally at the corporate culture needs to match what your customers are. Yeah. And you had mentioned the importance of mentorship. I'd like to talk about that for a moment. I often get asked by women who are aspiring to move up in an organization, what can I do to get noticed? You know, what can I do to, um, you know, to have, have that opportunity for that next stretch assignment? What would you say about mentorship and, and ways to, to, um, to make that a part of your own development? Yeah, I mean, mentorship and, and networking are the, are the key pieces. Um, mentorship, I always give this advice, um, and if anyone's listening right now that has gotten this advice from me before, they'll be smiling. I always say if you want to find a mentor um, and have a specific time frame with them. Ask someone to sit with you, know what your strengths and weaknesses are, pick three opportunities that you feel that you need to work on, and ask someone to mentor you for three months. And over the course of those three months, each month, ask them to work with you on a specific topic. Um, and then ask them to, over or during each of those months, that give you contacts that you can reach out to that they may feel um, they ha they know someone that's strong in that or can educate on you, uh, educate you with it. So you're not only expanding your network, but you are having those three focus areas that you can then sit down on and be able to see improvement. I think a lot of people sometimes feel like mentorship gets lost. There's no, there's no end date. So people don't really know how to judge the success of the mentorship. If you have that three month time period, when three months is over, you can reflect back on everything that you've learned and sit down with your mentor and decide, are there three more topics that we should be working on together? Or do you recommend that there's somebody else that I reach out to? So you're expanding your network at the same time as really having a start and end point to that mentorship. Yeah, I know that um, mentors too for women do not need to be women. You know, it's I, I've had plenty of male mentors and male sponsors in my career. So I want to make sure that, you know, that's being said. As far as mentorship goes, what you're talking about, Riley, is really having a program or structure around it. And I, I, I totally agree and believe um, that as well. I've seen mentor relationships not go well because there isn't clear, I call, you know, coaching objectives or a clear understanding of what role you're playing, what role I'm playing, what am I going to gain from this, and when are we going to end this, right? Or, or what's, what's our process of working together over a period of time, it can go sour if that isn't really established. So I'm glad mm -hmm. that you mentioned that. What do you see the difference between sponsorship 
and mentorship? And is that something that women should be seeking is sponsorship within uh, in their company? Absolutely, men and women. Um, opportunities are, you let them know when you just made a massive sale and and you want to either talk through it or you need a you know a confidence build up of hey you know what would you have done differently uh, i believe that's your yeah, that's your mentor uh and then your sponsor is somebody that may be in an executive position or a higher up leadership position that gets to see the good right that you you shine to them you let them know what you're, you're accomplishing at your company you let them know the projects that you've been successful on you can even let them know maybe about a failure and how you rebounded, but it's a really good relationship of someone that's going to speak about you when you're not there. And um, one of the quotes that I always share with people that I've heard is that 90% of your career decisions are made when you are not in the room. Meaning if you don't have that sponsor, you don't have someone that's your advocate that's talking about you. So when they're building a division out and they say, who do you think would be a good person for this? You need to have a sponsor for that. So it doesn't matter if you're, you're uh, male or female, you need to make sure that you're networking on both levels, the mentorship so that you get the training and the sponsorship so you get the advocacy when you're not there. Yeah, and I can recall um, 20 years ago when there were about four female executives out of maybe 30,000 people worldwide. And things certainly have changed. I'm sure you have more than four today. And I was fortunate that my boss's boss was a female executive. And, I, and she happened to be a female, but there were other male sponsors where, like you said, when you're not in the room and your name comes up, that they're able to support, support you in that way, or they're the ones that are bringing your name up and recommending you for different assignments or stretch assignments. And um, I just, I don't know if I would have learned what I did as a female leader um, or have gotten the growth that I did in the company if I wouldn't have had that sponsor. Probably for me, that sponsor was even more important than a mentor at the time. Because um, it can be a political environment. Life is politics, <laughs> so uh, not just work, life is. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's talk about life for a moment because as, as working moms, it's not easy. And I'd like to um, you know, swap some stories and, and share some things for our listeners on being a working mom and balancing and you know, how, how do you do that? Yeah, so um, my first and foremost comment that I'll make is that um, as working parents, because I don't want to forget the dads that are out there as well, I think that women are harder on themselves when we make decisions. Um, but it is definitely a working parent decision. Um, but we, we will need to make incredible points of trade-offs in our, in our professional careers, hands down. And we have to be extremely comfortable and confident in those decisions that we make. And a couple examples that I'm referring to are, I have made the decision not to go to a company-wide conference on the day it started because it fell over a holiday that I was not willing to give up with my daughter. I'm not saying that it, that was the best career move, but that was the move I had to make so that I could feel comfortable that I made the right decision for my family. Um, there's also been numerous nights, I travel almost every week, that I miss a lot of the day-to-day -day stuff. I miss, I miss tuck-ins, I miss the wake-up, I miss breakfast, I miss dinner. Um, we have to make these trade-offs and we have to make the ones that are, are right for us in the moment and we have to know where our priorities lie. Uh, and with that, Krista, as well, your company know, it needs to know where your priorities lie as well. And you need to be willing to let them know, hey, this is, this is going to work for me and this isn't. Yeah. Um, you can't sit there and just be, be upset about decisions as well. You need to make sure you're vocal. Well, and I, I also think that men kind of get the short end of the stick here because it's, it's thinking that this is something that only affects women, right? I mean, parents are, are both and we both have these same struggles or, or, or tugging uh, in terms of um, priorities and, and things that need to need to take place for the family, as well as for, you know, for business. And I, I think that it has changed a little bit, maybe since I, I was um, in, in leadership, in that 
it's more the, the family understanding and you know has just gotten a little bit more i don't know softer you know yeah um i, I can't speak towards the past but i can tell you that every time i've ever been vocal about something that I know I, where I need to be, or I need to work from home on this day because I have to pick up my daughter that day. I've never, I've never had an objection. Yeah. Um, and I feel as if though so, that may be very different stories um, between you and I and our experiences. Uh, so in that aspect, but, and, and I will say that, I, that men do the same. There's plenty of male, males that I work with that are fathers um, that say, hey, you know, you, you may hear my kid in the background. They have a fever today. We couldn't bring them to school. Yeah. So I do believe it's just more it is a work-life integration. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I think I think it is more acceptable. And I think it goes back to, um, you know, trying to grow within a male-dominated environment and trying to be accepted. Um, and, and, you know, I might not have brought up those things or I might have made a different sacrifice. I know personally... I took stretch assignments and moved frequently and pulled my girls with me because my husband was flexible enough to move as well. And I'm not sure if I would have um, gotten opportunities to grow if I wouldn't have um, been flexible enough to move. Yeah, I mean, I, I relocated as well. I travel for work all the time. I think that you have to be willing to, you can't have it all all the time. Um, mm -hmm. And you have to be willing, that's what they say, points of trade off. Um, and just like yourself, I mean, I had to make that decision that this is what my family will benefit from this. Um, I won't be there all the time for, for them, but I will be there and be 100% present. And I talk about that a lot is being, being present in the moment. And I find that I'm actually with the sacrifices that I've made, I find that I'm more present with my daughter than I've ever been before because I value that time that we have yeah. together. Yeah. And I remember those days when I when I had to get up early and leave before they were getting out of bed yeah. or those nights that I'm I'm in talking on the payphone, saying the prayers over the payphone in the airport because I couldn't be home. And those really were all sacrifices. And I often thought, well, it's the best thing for the family and they're gonna grow up to be strong women. And, you know, they're gonna, uh, I'm thinking they're gonna be in business. And I'll tell you a quick story, um, two as a, that come to mind. I remember driving my daughter to work one day, excuse me, dry, dropping her off at the daycare one day on my way to work, which normally her dad would do that, but he was sick and I had to do it. And I'm like in traffic and I'm talking to her like she's an adult, like I can't believe all this traffic, you know, I'm gonna be late for work and I'm all stressed out. And she looked at me and she said, yeah, mom, it's all the mommies going to work. And I was like, whoa, <laughs> you know, because <laughs> at the time her dad worked out of the home. I mean, she thought that the people that were going to work were all women. Um, so I, I'm wondering like how distorted um, was her upbringing. But the irony of it all is she wanted me to be a teacher mom because I could be home in the summer. And uh, today she's a fourth grade teacher. She's a teacher mom. So that was the career path that she chose. Um, and I'm so proud of her and she's like the best teacher. But I, I also think that as a working mom, we put a lot of pressure on ourselves that we're raising our family a certain way to be a certain way. And that's not necessarily, you know, what it's about. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, and I, I agree with that as well. And it's funny that you say that because there's nights that you go to bed and you wonder, right? We always say you have to be happy with the decision that you make, but you do wonder, am I making the right decision? But I think my daughter will definitely grow up and know that she saw her mother happy every day. And um, I think that's what makes me feel good. I'm, I'm following what I feel like is the right path for me. Um, and that's really the example that I want to set for her, that, that you have the ability to create whatever world it is you want. And I really believe I'm creating the world that is that I am most passionate about, that I'm happy to get up and, and go to every day, even if that means I sacrifice some of that, that extra time with my daughter. Yeah. And my story, and in, in, I left corporate America when my kids were nine and 11 and started my own business, which is K-Coaching today. And for me, that was the right time 
um, you know, for me to be to be there for them because at nine and eleven, two girls, I felt like they needed me way more than they might have when they were younger. And I don't know what I would have done. My mother was very, very helpful when the kids were little and I had that support, which um, I'm hopeful that a lot of women that have to make those decisions between family and career are seeking out, you know, the support that they need to be able to do that. Yeah, and I and I, I will say right now, because um, I would be remiss if I have this whole call about being a working mom, I couldn't do it without the family support that, that I have as well. So that is, that is a big piece. Absolutely. Any last thoughts or final things that you want to um, to add to our conversation? No, I just want to make sure that, you know, if, if any anyone that's on the call that's listening is, you know, take risks, um, be fearless. Um, those are the two biggest things that have really, I, I believe, have allowed me to advance as quickly as I have is just being willing to say, you know what, I want it, I'm going to try it, and then just refusing to fail. Yeah, so that, that's what I'd like to leave people with. And those two those two points that you made about networking and internal networking and mentorship, I think, are really practical for um, for any anyone that wants to advance in their that's career. Right. But especially, I would say, for women. And I think that there is a you know, there is a cultural shift. Right. Um, and you're in a much better place in time than perhaps I was. I remember. Um, one last story I remember was interviewing for a big position for the next level. And I was being interviewed by like a round table of people. I think it was the IT director at the time that, and I was moving potentially from Pennsylvania to North Carolina. And the interview question was, what do you think our boys are going to think about a woman coming down here trying to tell them what to do. <laughs> and that was the actual interview question. <laughs> I don't think they could get away with that anymore. <laughs> no, and, they definitely wouldn't. <laughs> no, isn't that funny? And that wasn't that long ago, right, when you think about it. So I remember my answer was something like, you know, I, I was I was like, well, just give me the chance and I'll show you or something corny like that. But um uh, I think that that's something that no one on this line could certainly expect to hear during an interview. So um, hopefully they're learning something from that. But it's wide open. It's what you make of it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And there's, I think they're they're just going to continue to be advances. Um, I mean, just look at look at the ratios of leadership from from 20 years ago to today, and um, it's really just going to become. It's just becoming better, more diverse. There's more inclusion, and I think that's the biggest piece: is being willing to be inclusive yeah. of everybody is going to make the difference. Well, I think the stats are showing too that there is an increase in women managers. It's that next level, it's that C yeah. level that there still remains a gap. And um, I, I think some of the thoughts and advice and stories that were shared today, and some of the things that you're doing within your own organization, are are leading others to be kind of um, following in those footsteps. So I admire you for that and I appreciate it. Yeah, and I think the last thought too, that someone said to me, when you get there, turn around and put your hand down and pull somebody else up. Um, and that's probably the biggest advice I have to women that are in senior leadership today. There is somebody, no matter what role you fulfill, there is somebody looking at you as, as, as a leader and a role model. Um, and if we can just turn around and extend a hand to some of those women that are looking to be mentored and want to be brought forward, that is what's going to make a difference as well. Yeah, that's great. That makes me think of hashtag girls club because that's really what yeah. they're doing as an organization. <laughs> yep, so I well, hope to see you at that event. Maybe I'll see you in person, but thank you. You will. So I will be there. <laughs> yeah, I Thank you very much. Great conversation. Thanks. Just want to tell everyone that the Krista Moore Show is live every Wednesday at 2 o'clock. We always have a variety of guests, and we also record every session. So feel free to go back and listen to any recordings. And here at K-Coaching, we care about you, and we care about your success. Thanks for joining us. Can I come out?
No? 